Hello everyone, welcome to my channel Prosto Hub and myself Dr. Jolsna. So today I am going to start off with a new topic which is one of the most commonly suggested topic in Prosto Hub and that is implant failures and its management. So let us see the contents. Contents include introduction, definition, the Albertson criteria for implant success, classification of implant failures, the different signs and symptoms and what is ailing, failing and failed implant the different factors contributing to implant failure and the perioperative errors that contributes to implant failure, the parameters that are used to evaluate failing or a failed implant, and peri-implantitis, maintenance of implant, finally conclusion and references. So the implant failure and its management is one of the most commonly asked 75 mark or 100 mark long essay. You can also expect short note from this topic like the prosthetic management of failed implant. And peri-implantitis is another very important topic uh, that can be asked again as a short note or a long essay. So let us start the session and before that I request everyone to please do like and share my videos if you are finding them useful. If you are new to this channel Prosto Hub, please do subscribe and support me. And if you have any queries, any topic that needs to be discussed, any feedback, do comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail id. So without any delay, let us get into the topic. Introduction. So, osseo integrated dental implants have been considered the most aesthetical and functional alternative to missing teeth. Despite the high success rates and stability of dental implants, failures do occur in this treatment. So, early detection of each and every failure and treatment of early progressive bone loss around the dental implants by mechanical debridement, antimicrobial therapy, and regenerative therapy should be done in order to save the early failing implants and hence it is mandatory for every clinician to know how and why the failures occur and how best we can prevent them in order to give this upcoming branch of the industry a new horizon. The definition of implant failure. So an implant failure may be defined as the first instance at which the performance of the implant measured in some quantitative way falls below a specified acceptable level. Or simply it can be defined as an implant that has a hopeless prognosis. It's the Albertson criteria for a successful implant. So in 1986, Albertson and colleagues formulated a criteria for a successful implant. So there are five. The first one, the implants are clinically immobile. That's individual unattached implant should be immobile when tested clinically. The second one, the radiograph should not demonstrate evidence of peri-implant radiolucency. The third one, vertical bone loss less than 0.2 mm annually following the implant's first year of service. Then individual implant performance should be characterized by absence of persistent and irreversible signs and symptoms like pain, infections, neuropathies, paresthesia, etc. And by these criteria, a success rate of 85% should be there at the end of 5-year observation period and 80% at the end of 10-year observation period. So these are the criteria formulated by Albertson and colleagues. So the classification of implant failures. So there are many classifications and I will be discussing the Brennamarks as well as niche classification of implant failure. So as per Brennamark et al., the reasons for implant failure is loss of bone anchorage, gingival problems and mechanical complication. So loss of bone am anchorage due to peri mucoperiosteal perforation or surgical trauma, gingival problems like proliferative gingivitis and fistula formation and mechanical complications like the implant fracture, fracture of the prosthesis, gold screws, abutment screws, etc. This is the MISH classification. So MISH has classified implant failures based on the time of occurrence of this failure. So he has classified it into six types. The first one surgical failure that happens during the time of surgery. Osseous healing failure that happens at the time of uh, healing period. So it is related to the healing ability of bone. Early loading failure. It's the first year the implant serves as a prosthetic abutment. The intermediate implant failure that happens after the first year of loading up to five years of function. That is one to five years. The late implant failure which happens after the implant and prosthesis have been loaded for greater than five years and less than 10 years. That is five to 10 year period and long term failure where failures happens after 10 years. What is ailing, failing and failed implants? 
So Ascari has classified implants into three types. The first one ailing implant that is implants exhibiting soft tissue problems and they have a more favorable prognosis. Whereas failing implant that is an implant that is progressively losing its bone anchorage but is still clinically stable and that's called as a failing implant where the failure process is in early stages and it's reversible. So the clinical features are progressive marginal bone loss, absence of mobility and peri-implantitis. Whereas a failed implant in which the failure process has reached the irreversible stage that is implant with mobility, excessive bone loss that is greater than 70 percentage and not amenable to treatment. So here marginal bone loss will be reaching the apical third of implant, mobility will be present and thin perifixtural radiolucency is also present. So these are the three types of implant, ailing, failing and failed implants. Let us see the signs and symptoms of implant failure. So the first one, horizontal mobility beyond 0.5 millimeter or any clinically observed vertical movement under less than 500 gram force. Rapid progressive bone loss regardless of stress reduction and peri-implant therapy. Pain during function or on percussion, dull sound on percussion, continued exudation in spite of surgical attempts of correction. around an implant. Greater than half of the surrounding bone is lost, a pocket depth of 5 mm and bleeding on probing index of 2 or above. So these are the signs and symptoms of implant failure. Let us discuss the complications or factors leading to implant failures. So there are four factors. The first one, surgical factors, prosthetic factors, implant related factors and host factors. Now let us see one by one in detail. Surgical factors that is early failures can happen during stage 1 or stage 2 surgery. So stage 1 surgery comprises of complications like overheating of bone leading to necrosis and osteomyelitis, lack of primary stability leading to bone loss, infection, lack of osseointegration, integration, poor placement or angulation, slips, eccentric drills, damage to vital structures and implant fracture. And stage 2 surgery complication include loose abutment, poor implant or a failed osseointegration, integration, early loading by prosthesis, poor abutments, etc. So the prosthodontic considerations in first stage implant failure. So the most common post-operative complication involves soft tissue breakdown of the wound and exposure of the implant body or the cover screw. So forces on the mucosa causes the soft tissue to be compressed over the implant. And the perforation of the soft tissue can also be caused by supracrystal protrusion of the implant or inadequate tightening of the cover screw. Insertion of interim processes too early also may affect the healing process adversely resulting in gingival perforation and implant exposure. So we have to take care that the processes, the implant should not be loaded in the early stage. Premature loading can also lead to micro movement. So for a completely edentulous patient, no prosthesis should be present over the implant site for approximately two weeks. And after two weeks, the old denture should be relieved over the implant site and relined with a resilient soft liner material. Prosthetic factors that lead to late failures, improper design shape and contours, poor fit of prosthesis, abnormal occlusal forces or the occlusal overloading, inaccurate framework, cantilever extension, framework fracture, prosthesis fracture, and functional problems like speech. Next, coming to implant related factors. So first one is the screw design. The conical screws tends to loosen and it's better to use flat head screws. The implant body design. So smooth cylinder implant, there will be shear forces at the implant bone interface. Whereas in threaded implant, it can transform and change the direction of force to the thread geometry. And the paper design did not engage the bone physically as nicely as the parallel one reducing the initial fixation. And under the thread geometry, there are different types of thread designs like the V-shaped, the um, square ones, the reverse buttress designs, etc. So the square threads show better resistance to torque forces than V-shaped or reverse buttress design. So if you wish to know more about the implant thread geometry, which is a very important short note, Please leave a comment below this video and I shall try to make a separate session on that. Next is the implant length and implant width. So when the implant length and width increases, it increases the 
surface area as it enhances or shear integration so these factors we have already discussed in the session of implant loading protocol session 2 the fourth factor is so patient dissatisfaction with the result inadequate patient follow up the failure to maintain hygiene leading to periodontal breakdown parafunctional habits systemic health like uh, diabetes collagen diseases like scleroderma sle etc have microvascular changes and medications which alter tissue metabolism and repair so the therapeutic radiation to mandible and maxilla and also long term steroid therapy also results in poor vascularity and may contraindicate implant use the social habits like smoking stress alcohol abuse affect the wound healing poor bone quality and quantity like a vascular bone the bone density type of bone etc and diseases like osteoporosis and paget's disease also compromise the implant osseo integration so we have completed the factors contributing to implant failure and next is the perioperative errors that contributes to implant failure which includes error due to anatomic variation and abnormalities error due to implant contamination errors in surgical technique implant position and implant exposure the first one error due to anatomic variation and abnormalities so ideal fixture placement depends on a pre operative clinical assessment of the bone configuration bone quality and quantity so we know that ideal implant position it should be at least 1.5 to 2 mm away from the adjacent teeth and the distance between two implants should be 3 mm and it should be at a minimum distance of 1.5 to 2 mm from the underlying nerve in order to avoid potential nerve injury the next error due to implant contamination so the contamination of implant surfaces interferes with osseo integration and leads to failure the errors in surgical technique so a successful implant placement depends highly on proper surgical technique and we have to maintain an adequate blood supply and also reduce hard and soft tissue surgical trauma in order to prevent the perioperative causes of implant failure and whenever there is a minimum amount of keratinized tissue the incision design is important so here the incision should be placed buccal or labial to the alveolar crest and such placement minimizes the chances of compromised blood supply to the area and also preserves the keratinized tissue the next one is the error in implant positioning so even if an implant uh, integrates successfully with the surrounding bone ultimately it can become a failure if it is poorly positioned so the implant placed too buccal or lingual there is a chance that of a bone dehiscence a lack of bicortical support and eventually an implant exposure so attention to proper intraoperative angulation as well as maintenance of a parallelism between implants and between implant and natural tooth it contributes to optimal and successful prosthetic design and function and the implant exposure so in order to prevent implant exposure generally 4 to 6 month of healing period is allowed and also adequate keratinized tissue should be present over the implant if there is an adequate amount of keratinized tissue but it's not located over the implant then a label or a buccal flap can be elevated and the tissue can be shifted to surround the implant and we also have to ensure that there is adequate keratinized gingiva surrounding the crowns so these are the errors that can result in implant failure the perioperative errors let us see the parameters used to evaluate failing or failed implants so while it is possible to clearly differentiate between a successful and a failed implant it still remains difficult to identify the failing implants so six parameters have been proposed and the ideal parameter for monitoring implant condition should be sensitive enough to distinguish the early signs of implant failure so let us see these parameters the first one clinical signs of early or late infection so clinical signs of infection such as a hyperplastic soft tissue separation swelling fistulation color changes of the marginal periimplant tissue etc are some signs which call for intervention the next one is bleeding on probing so bleeding on probing has been employed to measure periimplant tissue conditions however recent findings suggest that it cannot be used to discriminate between a healthy or a diseased peri implant state because it does not have a scientific support the next parameter is 
throbbing depths. So, sulcus depth greater than 5 to 6 mm around the implants have a greater incidence of anaerobic bacteria and may require intervention in the presence of inflammation or exudate. So, probing not only measures the pocket depth but also reveals the tissue consistency, bleeding and also the presence of exudate. The fourth parameter is pain or sensitivity. So, percussion as well as forces of 500 gram may be used clinically to evaluate implant pain or discomfort. So, when there is pain during function from an implant body, uh, that places the implant in the failure category. The next parameter is clinical discernible mobility. So, mobility is considered as the cardinal sign of implant failure. So, once a clinician has distinguished between the mobility of a poorly connected abutment and the mobility of the underlying implant, then the implant must be suspected to be surrounded by a fibrous tissue capsule. So, mobility is always a clear sign of failure. The next parameter is radiographic signs of failure. So, according to Brennamark, the mean bone loss of osseointegrated integrated implants is 1.5 mm for the first year, followed by a mean bone loss of 0.1 mm per year. So, when there is a suspected perifixtural radiolucency or excessive marginal bone loss, it is always recommended to remove the prosthetic construction and check the implant for stability. Now, the final parameter that is dull sound at percussion. So, it has been suggested that a subdued sound upon percussion is indicative of soft tissue encapsulation whereas a clear crystallization sound indicates a successful osseointegration. integration. So, this is a rather a subjective test without a solid scientific background still it provides a useful indication to the examiner. So, these are the parameters that are used to evaluate failing or failed implants. The next topic to discuss is peri-implantitis which is a very important uh, topic which can come as a short note or as a long essay. So, this is a very vast topic and I need to explain it in detail. So, I will be continuing it in the next session. So, thank you all for watching my video. Please do like, share and subscribe my channel if you are finding these videos useful. And if you have any queries, doubts, suggestions, topic that needs to be discussed, you can comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail id. So it's bye from Prostohub until our next session.